Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere comes from MX Publishing, the best in new Sherlock Holmes novels, biographies, graphic novels, and short story collections every month. Find them online at mxpublishing.com. And the Wes Express, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wesexpress.com. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 199, Sherlockian Dynamo. I hear of Sherlock Everywhere, since you became a strong In a world where it's always 1895, or comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. <laughs> the game's afoot as we discuss goings on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger streeter regulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burt Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Well, hello and welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Burt Walder. Burt, you are a dynamo yourself aren't you? (laughs) Well, you know, I've had a lot of arguments with uh, Thomas Edison about AC versus DC, and I think my alternating current is going to win out, so we'll see. Well, that's very direct of you. I appreciate that. Uh, As long as you don't electrocute an elephant in the process. Oh, no, I wouldn't do that. Appreciate that. Poor Jumbo. Poor Jumbo. Uh, Well, this is episode 199. We are one episode away from 200 and you can find the notes for this episode at ihose.co slash ihose199, all lowercase. That'll take you to our website where you can find links and pictures and quotes and all sorts of uh, things. And, of course, the archives of our blog as well as the show. We do encourage you to share from that site. So let other people know you're reading it and uh, share it to your favorite social network, your email distribution list, your Scion Society, whatever works. We do appreciate your support. And we also appreciate your monetary support. You've been very generous, and we see those donations as they come in, and we are right on the cusp of making more transcripts available. We have some back uh, episodes to go through, but we're going to start rolling the transcripts out with more regularity as we move into the weeks ahead. So thank you for your support, and stay tuned on that front. Now, Bert, before we get into Uh, the introduction for our guest this episode. Have you seen the new trailer for Enola Holmes? Oh, I have. It's great. It looks like great fun, doesn't it? It does, you know, and I'm interested in seeing Henry Cavill's, uh, or yeah, however his last name is pronounced, Henry Cavill's um, uh, presentation of Sherlock Holmes. It's nice to see some, I've never, I don't think there's ever been anyone else who played Superman who, uh, went on to play a very Victorian Superman, Sherlock Holmes. That's really interesting. Well, you know, in the trailer, as I looked at him uh, in this role, he actually struck me as, um, you know, look, we've, we've seen Benedict Cumberbatch, we've seen Jeremy Brett, we've seen your, your typical, uh, you know, thin and, uh, you know, more ascetic type Sherlock Holmeses. And, and Henry Cavill is much more of a strapping man. Uh, and he seemed to me to resemble a kind of like a, a 21st century William Gillette in the role. Oh, I like that. You know, that's well, just and, their job. And, yeah. And, and, Mill, and Millie Bobby Brown looks just great. Oh, she's fantastic. Loved her in, uh, in Stranger Things. And uh, she's got a promising career ahead of her. And it just, the trailer looks like great fun. So check that out. And, you know, I'm just left to wonder before we, we hop in here, are the fans of Henry Cavill called Cavaliers? Oh, I like that. That's a great idea. Yeah. Well, 
I'll leave that out there for anyone who wants to start the fan club. Well, David Markham is the author of over nearly 70 Sherlockian pastiches, some published in anthologies and magazines such as The Strand, and others collected in his own books, The Papers of Sherlock Holmes, Sherlock Holmes and a Quantity of Debt, and Sherlock Holmes' Tangled Skeins. He has edited nearly 60 books, including several dozen traditional Sherlockian anthologies for MX Books and Belanger Books, as well as the ongoing series for uh, MX called the MX Book of New Sherlock Holmes Stories. We'll be talking about that in just a moment. He created that series uh, in 2015, up to 21 volumes now. Uh, David has contributed uh, numerous Sherlockian essays to various publications. He's a member of Sherlockian groups and science and is a licensed civil engineer. He lives in Tennessee with his wife and his son, and he has an irregular Sherlockian blog, a 17-step program. David, welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Hi, it's nice to speak to you all tonight. Well, we are delighted to have you here. We've been following your work for a number of years, certainly uh, the MX books, which uh, we're going to talk about in great length, I hope. Um, but why don't we why don't we harken back to the harken back to yesteryear and you take us to uh, your first meeting with Sherlock Holmes? Okay. Well, um, generally, I believe that everybody kind of knows who Holmes is uh, from very early age. Uh, if you show someone a deerstalker, magnifying glass, or a pipe, or things like that, uh, the general tropes that are associated with him, people naturally know that that stands for detective, even if they don't know the specifics about the character. But uh, I'm sure I knew about Sherlock Holmes for, before I started reading him. But uh, it was pro- I was 10 years old when I actually got my first Holmes book. And I remember the circumstances because at the time I was very interested in Hardy Boys books. And I remember I would do just about anything uh, to co- be able to collect and read all of those titles. It was a, a series. At the time, I think it was about 50, 52 titles. And I was trying to track them all down. And I had a friend who had some that I very much coveted. And one day after school, we had arranged a trade where I was going to trade something for some of the books that he had. But for some reason, I didn't feel like what he was offering was quite equal to whatever it was that I was offering. So he kind of looked around and he uh, offered a, a Sherlock Holmes book to even up the deal. And I've talked to several people uh, over the years who had this same book as their first Sherlock Holmes book. It was a 1954 edition published by Whitman for children, but uh, it had eight stories from the adventures in it. And the stories themselves weren't abridged, but the adventures was abridged from 12 stories down to eight. And so I, I went ahead and took the trade, even though I couldn't really have cared less about that book, and I put it on the shelf and forgot about it. But several weeks later, uh, I think it was a Saturday afternoon, rainy day, and there was a rerun of a movie on television, which was the 1966 film A Study in Terror. And um, at that time, that movie was less than 10 years old, which is kind of mind-blowing to me how much time has passed since then, that that's really considered an old movie. But uh, even though I didn't really know anything about anything about that movie, I could tell that the guy on screen was Sherlock Holmes. And Dr. Watson was with him. You know, it's clearly Holmes and Watson. So I enthusiastically went back and got this book from off of my shelf and started reading it. And um, that was kind of it. I was hooked. Uh, I tracked down another book after that, uh, a paperback edition of The Return, so I actually read The Empty House and how Holmes survived Reichenbach before I knew that he had supposedly died at Reichenbach. Oh, no. <laughs> I got that out of order. And that kind of taught me early on that if there's a series or something, you should try and read it in order chronologically. Huh. But uh, for several years, I would just pick up books as I could find them. I, I picked up, I got the entire canon. Uh, I quickly got the Double Day edition as soon as I knew that it existed, and that was my first complete edition of the canon. And um, I had to borrow way ahead on my allowance to get that book. And so my first loan, I like to say, that I ever took out in my life was actually for Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> but 
uh, I would ask for various homes related books for Christmas uh, and fill in that way. My dad would get these catalogs of remaindered books and there would be titles in those uh, such as Sherlock Holmes, Baker Street by Baron Gould and things like that. So uh, gradually I just snagged stuff as it came along and, and no matter what else I was reading, I was also always kind of still interested in Sherlock Holmes. And it grew Were you? That. Were you always a collector? It sounds like you were even at that age, you know, with your allowance and so on. And you mentioned the Hardy Boys. You really wanted you wanted books. It, it was. Like. I, I started reading uh, very young. My dad gave me a bunch of his books from when he was a boy in the 1940s. And in, I guess, third grade, I would have been about eight years old, I found a series called The Three Investigators. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of those, but they're uh, kids detectives. There's three guys, and they're very well written. They still hold up even to read them as an adult. And I would check them out of the library, and I was just amazed by those. And so I told all my friends about those books and got them interested, and then suddenly realized that I'd really messed things up because all the books were now all checked out by my friends, and I couldn't read the next one. <laughs> So uh, at some point in there, we had gone shopping for uh, our school clothes, and I saw in the store uh, these same three investigators' books for sale, and it was like a lightning strike. I realized I can own this and read it whenever I want to. And so I started collecting those. There were only a dozen or so titles of those, and so about the time I'd read everything of those, I had a relative who gave me a couple Hardy Boys for Christmas, and if you recall, if you ever read the Hardy Boys, they have a checklist on the back of all the books showing all the titles. So it's perfectly geared for people like me to know what else there is and, and that you need to have it and you need to buy it and you need to own it. And so I've always just kind of been like that since then. I like having the book when I, when I want to read it, when I want to go back and reread it or refer to it. And my wife is a librarian. And she's very tolerant, considering the fact that her kind of philosophy is that it's okay for a book to be in the library. You don't need to have it in the house. But uh, she she still lets me play at this. How many books do you have in the house? Oh, I don't know. I counted my Holmes books a few months ago because I hadn't done it in a while. And I have about 4,000 of those. And I'd say probably six or 8,000 more I haven't really counted everything else, but I have more books that aren't Sherlock Holmes than I do Holmes. And do you still have that 1954 Whitman copy? I do. Uh, still the same one. Uh, I know that you guys know Dan Andriaco, and I believe that was his first Holmes book also, and several people have talked about that's that's the one that they started with. So of all those books, do you have a favorite? Do you have, let's put it this way. If if the fire alarms went off, what were the what would what would be the ten books you'd grab? Oh ten. You're gonna make me list ten. <laughs> well, or two or five. You know, what are your favorites? Um I I'm sentimental about the early ones that I found. For instance, that double day edition that I said I bought with my borrowed ahead allowance and my Sherlock Holmes of Baker Street, which uh I read before I'd even actually read all of the canon so I, I knew about his theories about Holmes biography before I knew some of the actual stories so uh, let's see I guess assuming this uh, fire allows me enough time to gather all from all kinds of places and piles uh, my two volume Baron Gould annotated I'm very sentimental about that one as well uh, probably some something that I wrote too just because you know, uh, my, your own book, you're, you feel special about that, so, and a few others, but that's enough. I'm curious, because I've seen pictures of you, uh, David, on uh, certainly on Facebook and other places. You always seem to be wearing a deerstalker. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, um, I don't know if we'll talk about this other part or not, but uh, my dad was actually a state investigator. Uh, with the state of Tennessee, and uh, he worked out of his house, or out of our house. Uh, he covered several different counties, and what with reading mysteries and also his profession, 
I was very interested in mysteries and things like that. And so early on, I wanted a deer stalker. I passionately wanted one when I was a child. And for a little while, I had made one out of two baseball caps. Uh, I cut the bill off of one of the caps and sewed it to the other one. And that seemed to be good enough for a while. But um, I never really stopped wanting one. And finally, when I was 19 for my birthday, my parents sent away to a store in New York and bought a real deer stalker. It wasn't a costume deer stalker or uh, anything that would fall apart very easily. And so I had that for my 19th birthday, and I had come home for the day from college, and I went back to school. And so I had this hat, and I looked at it, and I kind of had to decide whether I was going to just put it on a shelf and let it get dusty, or if I was going to actually wear the hat and walk the walk and talk the talk. So I took a deep breath and put it on and, and wore it across campus to lunch, and people liked it. And so I wore it for the rest of my time at college, and it was kind of my my thing. People knew who I was by way of that, and I I was in yearbook photos wearing the deer stalker. And after I graduated, I continued to wear it pretty much as my only hat. Uh, I'd wear it shopping and and on vacations and and hiking and walking in the park. And um, after several years, I finally wore out that deer stalker. So it was just natural to find another one. And it's continued to the present. I think it's 36 years now that I've been wearing that type of hat. And I'm on my fifth one now because I've uh, just run through the others. They just, even though they were good quality hats, uh, had that many years of day to day wear, it was time for another one. <laughs> So do you do you wear the same? Uh, is it is it tweed? Is it wool? What what's the what's the material? It's wool, um, oh. and actually I have more than one. Uh, I've been able to go to England several times now, and I bought several while I was over there. Uh, and sometimes I rotate into those others, but mostly I wear the same one. And it is it's uh, good quality, you know, wool, uh, from, and it's handmade from a place in Ireland. Uh, that's where I bought the last several hats. So, so you're wearing you're wearing that heavy wool in the middle of summer too. Um, well, I should say I wear it year round, and if it's a hat wearing occasion in summer, that's what I wear. I okay. don't I don't wear a hat just to have it on, like like you said, you know, in the hottest part of summer. If it's not a hat wearing time, I, I'm just bareheaded like everybody else. Well, you know, the reason I ask is because Bert and I are both uh, hat aficionados and, oh, yeah. um, you know, we are in the midst. This is high season of uh, of straw hat time. And I think uh, the straw hat day uh, officially closes, what is it, September 15th, Bert, right? Yes, yes. That's actually felt hat day. September felt hat 15th. day, yeah. So it's the close of one season, the opening of another. We should advocate for a Sherlockian straw hat. Yeah. A deer stalker. <laughs> Panama kind of thing, you know? I would love one of those. <laughs> you could buy one and just kind of trim the sides. You know, the, every I mean, you all know that, that Billy Wilder's film, The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, was cut up and never released and, and isn't really available today in the same form Billy Wilder um, wrote it and produced it and had the idea. Right. But one of the things in those missing stories takes place on a boat and there are stills or there are rushes that you can see of this. And Robert Stevens is wearing the silliest, I must say, the silliest. It looks like a, a white linen, white linen or white cotton deer stalker in those, uh, in right. those. I think, I think he's, in fact, I think he's wearing all white, including a, uh, a faux white cotton deer stalker, which is quite the most bizarre deer stalker I think I've ever seen. Yeah. I, I, completeness is a good thing, but maybe it's good they cut that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's wonderful, your commitment to that. But, um, you know, I'm. Uh, you know, we do want to get on and talk about your writing, but I'm just curious, you know, as somebody young and in college, well, of course, when, when you know, when you're in college, I mean, uh, you know, people get up to all sorts of things. So I suppose somebody walking around campus, did it ever help you make any great connections? Did you get into class and the English professor said, my God, you know, you must be a Sherlock Holmes enthusiast. Or did you meet a young woman who said, oh, you know, you're, you're just my sort of guy with that hat well, or, or not. <laughs> I, I had some teachers, of course, recognize it. I don't think it got me any points or anything extra. 
uh, amazingly around her, or maybe not amazingly, is how many people don't seem to recognize it or don't even seem to pay any attention to it. Uh, I early in, in the early years when I wore it, I would expect somebody to come up and say like, "Oh, you like Sherlock Holmes? I do too." But nobody ever really did. And a couple people would say stuff that uh, was incorrect. Like one guy came up and said, "Oh, Inspector Clouseau," and uh, <laughs> but um, sounds I, like an Inspector Clouseau fan. Yes, uh, <laughs> but I met my wife uh, the summer before my senior year in college. And thank heavens, she had not only read Sherlock Holmes, but she knew of a bookstore around here that I didn't know about that had Holmes books that I didn't have yet or know about. And she wasn't embarrassed to be seen with me. And she still isn't, because I still wear that hat when we go, if we go anywhere now. People don't go anywhere lately, but uh, uh, she kind of knew going in that I was a deer stalker guy, and she still married me. So uh, this is uh, probably the most appropriate time to segue to uh, you know, a couple of bits of information from your bio that we read uh, that were astounding. Author of nearly 70 Sherlockian pastiches. That's yeah. insane. How, t- <laughs> tell us about your first pastiche and how you got into it. Well, um, I'd always wanted to write, even when I was little. Uh, I remember knocking out you know, little novels. I thought they were novels on my dad's typewriter. And it would be like about a paragraph a page on 20 sheets of typing paper. And I'd be really proud of it. But uh, when uh, I, we may mention it later, but for a good part of my thirties or my twenties and early thirties, I was actually a federal investigator uh, for a little known agency of the U S government. And we would have to travel all over the country So I was going to be in Albuquerque, I think, for three months. And about the second day, I got bored and I went to Walmart and bought a typewriter and a pack of typing paper and sat down and started trying to write a book. And this would have been in the early 1990s. And the the book I was writing, and I ended up finishing it, is more like a Robert Ludlum type thriller. And it's uh, I still have it. It's in a briefcase underneath my bed. But uh, over over those times when I was working on that, I kind of learned that you don't actually get anything written unless you sit in the chair and, and make yourself do it. And so then it, there was pretty much nothing for a long time. But um, in 2008, I was by that time, I the government agency where I worked had closed and I had gone back to school to be a civil engineer. And so. In 2008, I was laid off from an engineering job, and I decided, like, I wonder if I can write pastiches, because I've I've loved so many of them. I've collected and read so many. Um, So I had an idea for one, but it was kind of complicated. So I decided to write a few others instead, just kind of as practice to warm up to that more complicated idea. And over the course of that summer, I ended up writing nine of them. And I I put them all, I printed them out, put them in a binder and put them on the shelf with my Sherlock Holmes collection. And that was kind of it. I didn't tell anybody. I just, I was satisfied that I knew, I thought how to write some. But um, over the course of the next few years, I started showing one or the other, sending them to friends and showing them to people. And they said, well, these are good. So I got interested in seeing them in an actual real book that uh, other people could read. And so I approached a guy named George Vanderberg, who you guys may know. Oh, sure. Yeah. And uh, because I had bought some books from him before and I sent him this and said, um, you know, would, is this publishable? And he said, yes. So he published it. And that was in 2011. Um, And then I didn't do anything else for a while. Uh, That book it, I guess it may still be out there, but there there weren't many printed. Uh, Otto Pinsler sold it at the Mysterious Bookshop, and uh, Joel and Carolyn Center sold it through their classic specialties, so that was very nice of them. But then uh, in 2013, I managed to get introduced by way of email to Steve Emix, and I said, I have this book with another publisher. Could I publish it with you? 
and he he did and uh not long after that then i kind of got inspired to start writing more of them so I, I knocked out a few more and then the various anthologies came along and as long as i was editing those i wanted to write my own story to be included in it too so just with different projects going on i kept writing stories and i looked up one day and it was starting to add up how many that i had written and so uh i guess a couple months ago now i passed that magic canonical number of 60 and and now I'm getting closer to 70 now do you have a favorite of all of the sherlock stories you've written um i i do uh it was the first novel that i tried to write it was after it was the next thing i did after that uh initial collection of nine and it was after i had uh gone to mx books and after mx had pu- republished that first collection it's the the one called Sherlock Holmes and a Quantity of Debt, and it's basically set just over 24 hours in in a house during a, a cataclysmic weather event, and this uh, uh, mystery from 50 years before is kind of uncovered. A body is found uh, that has been buried for that long, and, and then uh, all kinds of family secrets come out over the course of that 24 hours. Well, we're going to take a quick break here and hear from one of our sponsors. And after we come back, we will be speaking more with David Markham. Stay tuned. Well, it's highly appropriate that we've got a representative from MX Publishing with us on the show today. Uh, But that certainly leaves us more opportunity to talk about other things going on at MX Publishing. We are grateful for their sponsorship. And um, they actually just recently announced a new book launch. It's called Sherlock and Irene. That's tantalizing, would you think? Yes, yes. You know, we know so much about Irene, but um, Sherlock and Irene, the secret truth behind a scandal in Bohemia is Hmm. by Chris Chan, and it explores unanswered, I love this, it explores unanswered questions, (laughs) of which there are many in Scandal in Bohemia, suggesting that there's much more to the case than is generally suspected. Yeah, like why did Holmes make so many elementary mistakes? Was he really a cocaine user? Was the king of Bohemia hiding a dark secret? Why was that photograph so dangerous? And why was Irene in such a hurry to get married? Answers to questions like these and more await you in Chris Chan's Sherlock and Irene. The Secret Truth Behind a Scandal in Bohemia. Find it at mxpublishing.com. David, I have to ask you, on behalf of the shade of Arthur Conan Doyle, how do you, what's your, what's your, um, what do you think about the plotting? You know, that's what drove Conan Doyle. Well, I wouldn't say drove him crazy, but that's what, that's what he apparently enjoyed least about creating the Sherlock Holmes stories? Well, uh, I've had two experiences with that. Uh, a lot of times when I write, I just, I literally sit down with an open, brand new, unsaved Word document and just start writing, uh, basically letting Watson whisper in my ear. And in those cases, I don't really know what the plot is going to be. It's uh, one of those typewriters that I've heard called seat of your pants writing. And uh, when I hear, or when somebody starts up the 17 steps to the sitting room, I don't know who it's going to be any more than Watson does when he's narrating it. And as I go through it, things start to pull in and start to make sense and connections start to be obvious. And so I enjoy those. And it's it's a process that's really draining and kind of scary, but I kind of trust it at this point. Um, I I don't know what a reader thinks. You know, they may say like, oh, it shows that he's doing stuff like that. (laughs) But uh, I've had a a few others where I've had to uh, write more toward a specific goal. Uh, There have been books that have certain types of themes, uh, like uh, some of the MX collections have been about the untold cases. And uh, I picked for one of those, the Brooks and Woodhouse which is mentioned in the Bruce Partington plans. So I had to aim toward 
involving Brooks and Woodhouse, knowing going up front that uh, my normal seat of the pants riding style had to be reined in a little bit to actually be aimed toward a certain target. Um, MX is involved now in a program called Deer Homes, where where we write uh, letters, it's five letters, four of them are written to homes with clues that lead to the next letter, and then the fifth letter is a letter back from homes with a solution, and those are quite difficult because you, or at least I, you know, I have to plan out ahead of time what the clues are and, and layer things in much more than just kind of making it up as I go. So, um, I, I appreciate Doyle's uh, uh, ability to to construct those things and make it seem so effortless and, and lay things in. Well, speaking of effortless, uh, take us through the the origins of uh, the MX book of Sherlock Holmes. When when did it first happen, and how did it come about? Well, um, it was January 2015. And I know this because I saw it mentioned recently by a friend of mine named Bob Byrne uh, because I I had emailed him on that morning when I had the idea. Um, it was uh, a day that I'd had a dream where I had edited something. I didn't know anything more than that, but it popped me awake. And instead of going back to sleep, I went ahead and got up and thought about it. And I was thinking, you know, I, I could edit a book. I could gather some stories. And so I walked in and looked at my Holmes collection and started trying to think of some authors that I'd either emailed in the past or that I respected or that I wished they would write some more stories. So later that that morning, uh, I emailed Bob and said, what do you think of this idea? And I emailed another Sherlockian friend named Marcy Wilson, and they both thought it was okay. So then I emailed Steve Emix and said, you know, if I if I did this, would you have any interest in publishing it? And he said, sure. So then I got uh, ambitious and started emailing authors that I'd initially thought of, and then I thought of more authors and more authors and more authors. And I was really just emailing anybody I could think of uh, that either wrote stories already or that were Sherlockians that might want to write their first pastiche. And I really just at that time had hopes that maybe it would be a book of 12 stories and maybe a little paperback edition. And uh, gradually uh, people started accepting and I realized that there's a chance this might work. Uh, people have seemed to be enthused, but it's still a long way between people saying they would do it and actually sending a story. Um, one of the first people that uh, uh, said yes, just, turned right around was Lindsay Fay, who I know you guys know. And uh, so, you know, then I started to think this had a real possibility of being something. And um, as time went on and the stories started to arrive and then more stories and more stories, it seemed like this is going to be a really fat book after all. And I think we had, uh, by that point, Steve and I had kind of worked out the formatting and the, the the size of the books and things like that. And then all of a sudden, Steve wrote to me and said that uh, he had a bunch more people who wanted to contribute too, and including Jay Ganguly and some others. And my first thought was, we can't do this because this book's going to fall apart. It's too fat. <laughs> so uh, I emailed Steve back and said, we're going to have to go to two books. And he thought about it and said, okay. And before we were done with that first set over the course of 2015, uh, it had, I think, gone up to 63 stories. And it was three really big fat books, uh, probably over 500 pages each. It was, it was kind of the largest collection of new stories like that. And I understand that had ever been published. But it just started with me thinking it was going to be a, a small little volume that might or might not have enough participation to even exist now what sort of reaction have you had have you been pleased with the reaction oh i've been amazed for all kinds of reasons um initially i think it was uh it, it got a lot more attention in england than, than it did here because the, there was an article about it when it was in the, the preparation stage in the radio times 
and um, uh, I'm losing my train of thought here. But um, at the time, it seemed to it get a lot of attention of attention amongst Sherlockian pastiche fans. But as as the time has gone by, it's uh, gotten much more attention in a widespread area. Like uh, I think the last 16 volumes that have come out have all been reviewed by Publishers Weekly, for instance. So it's it's more well known maybe than I even realize from from my perspective. Just sitting here reading the the stories and trying to put it together at this end. Yeah, the latest. Um... Let me see the latest Publishers Weekly uh, review of volume, wow, 21 we're up to now. Yeah. Uh, it says, one of Conan Doyle's most tragic creations, the eponymous Veiled Lodger, gets a believable and intriguing after story in Mark Mower's The Unveiled Lodger. Eugenia Ronder, the original Veiled Lodger, has rebuilt her life, but is troubled by a coded message she found on her property in a clever twist. Michael Mallory makes Watson's decision to reveal in print the location of his sensitive cache of untold tales essential to the plot of the adventure of the doctor's hand. This is another must have for Sherlockians. Yep. That's going to make you feel good. Oh, it does. Uh, it's, it's also a little bit of pressure because uh, I, I read these books and put them together before anybody else gets to see, see the stories in their, in their, entirety that way and so every time there's a little bit of pressure now like oh, will publishers weekly whoever this mysterious reviewer is will they like this one i think they will will they yeah <laughs> so according to the statistics we have from steve mx um you have edited 504 original stories for mx anthologies um I would have to imagine, after 21 volumes and counting, uh, 504 stories, uh, you must have seen it all. I mean, no. it, are, are there still original ideas left out there within the genre of pastiche? I think there are, uh, because the home stories can jump in just about any direction. Uh, you know, they can be set in the city or the country. They can have a humorous twist or a dark, tragic twist. They can be a police procedural or they can be some kind of a, a gothic horror story. And um, as I mentioned before, we've, we've done several volumes, what we call the untold cases, where you have the, the giant rat or Crosby the banker or stories like that. And obviously there are many versions of these. Uh, you know, uh, I think there's 20 or 30 versions of the giant rat just the traditional versions. That's not even counting the ones where it's some kind of a supernatural uh, version. But um, everyone is so different that uh, they don't take away from the others. And and so I, I approach each story when I get it uh, with just such anticipation. I'm still like a kid who has just tapped into this magic Holmes fire hose. And uh, people send me stories all the time. It's the most amazing thing. So what makes your heart flutter as an editor when, uh, when you open up some of those, uh, those documents? Well, um, you know, obviously I get a lot of stories and I can't use them all. There are probably about 10% that get sent in for each set that for one reason or another I, I'm just unable to use. Either there's big plot holes that just can't be put together or the author is very enthusiastic, but they don't really understand Holmes and Watson. They they really want to be part of it, but they just don't have a story that's good enough. But there are some of the authors, especially, who just absolutely capture Watson's voice. And so when I sit down with the printed out story and a red pen, uh, for those authors, I know I don't really have to worry that anything's going to go wrong in the middle or that there's going to be a plot hole or an unsatisfying ending. It's it's just like the same enthusiasm as I had as a boy uh, with this trust that this story is going to be a good one. So when we're when we're looking at, um, you know, the the MX book, I, I think one of the things that has set it apart from a lot of other uh, anthologies, a lot of other pastiche collections 
um, is there's always been a charitable element to the business model. And in the case of uh, the original three volumes, which let, let's not forget, these were originally begun as Kickstarter projects. It was, it was a, a bulk thing. There were three volumes on right. Kickstarter. And I think um, I have in my notes back when we published it, uh, Derek Belanger wrote it up for us, uh, July 20th, 2015. Uh, he said that uh, within 48 hours, the Kickstarter campaign raised its initial goal of 2,000 pounds. However, a more ambitious goal is to raise 10,000 by the time the Kickstarter campaign concludes on August 16th. And in fact, the Kickstarter uh, campaign concluded with nearly 15,000 pounds in uh, pledges and support. So that was uh, remarkable. Um, and in this case, the proceeds went to Stepping Stones School. Can you tell us a little bit about Stepping Stones and your involvement with uh, with that and, and a little little bit about the location? Okay. Um, well, when this started uh, and when I had the idea for maybe a little book of short stories, I hadn't thought anything about royalties or anything like that. And at some point very early on, I thought like, well, if this sells just a you know, few copies, we're going to have to divide whatever royalties there are between about 12 people, just pennies or a few dollars a piece. And it doesn't seem like it's worth the trouble. And I remembered that MX had done uh, several, a couple books at least, uh, where the funds and the royalties went to support saving Undershaw. Uh, for people who don't know, Undershaw was one of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's homes where he lived with his first wife. He had it built special in a little town called Hindhead. And uh, she was ill with tuberculosis, so he had it built with shallow steps. And uh, it had, I believe, just nice breeze and nice conditions for somebody with her medical condition. And he lived there for a number of years. It was while he was there that he... Um, he resurrected Holmes. He wrote Hound of the Baskervilles there, and he wrote The Return of Sherlock Holmes while he lived there. So then he uh, he moved away after that, and then the house went through a number of uh, changes and owners through the years. And for a long time, it was a hotel that had uh, been in existence for decades, I guess. And as a hotel, it had uh, suffered some pretty bad structural uh problems uh they had done some things like i think i heard the story where to cut some duct work or whatever they had cut through a bunch of floor joists so uh there was one room that was almost in danger of falling off of the house because it wasn't really attached and uh after that hotel left as and people know this better than me but i may be getting some of it wrong but after the hotel left the house stood abandoned for a number of years and vandals had damaged it and at some point, um, it was decided by some developers to buy it and either tear it down or cut it up into condominiums. And at that point, there was a, a movement that grew up to save Undershaw. And uh, there were a lot of different opinions about what should be done with it. It should be made into a museum or it should be made into a, a Victorian-type house with one owner who maintained it uh, with Victorian uh fixtures and everything. But uh, there was a guy named David Forbes Nixon who had a, a foundation called the DFN Foundation. And he has a son uh, with special needs who attended a nearby school named Undershaw. And he and I guess some other people had the idea of buying the Undershaw property and converting it into a facility that could hold the Stepping Stone School. And I think that was kind of controversial for a while because, for instance, they were going to build or they did build a, a big new building attached to the original house with classrooms and a swimming pool and an auditorium. And there were some other uh, changes at the property that had to be made. Uh, they There was a well that had to be filled in because you just you didn't really want a well at a school and things like that. But uh, by the time I had the idea for the MX books and had the I, the realization that we needed to send the royalties somewhere, uh, it, it seemed like a good idea to send them to save Undershaw. 
So I spoke with Steve and he said, well, that's when he informed me that the building had been bought by the school. They said, we don't really need to save under Shaw anymore, but we can send the money to the school instead. So that became a really powerful recruiting tool for people who wanted to participate in the books because not only could they write a Sherlock Holmes story, but they could uh, donate their royalties to a school for special needs students at Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's former house. And uh, since then, um, over the course of all the different books, we've raised somewhere over $65,000 now for the school. Wow. And I, I know they've used it for things. They have a special uh, Conan Doyle room there, and, and they they use that money for different things. Um, I was able to go over back to England twice in association with these books, once when the first set was published in 2015, and then I got to go back in 2016 when the school had its grand opening at Undershaw, and I was actually invited by Mr. Forbes Nixon uh, to be part of the, the, the ceremony. And at the time, he told me that he really appreciated the books because he was trying to kind of wean the school off of his foundation and, and have it more stand on its own. So the money from these books would really help as part of that process. Oh, that must have made you feel wonderful. Oh, it did. Uh, I, I, I didn't really, the whole, uh, the months I was putting the books together, I was getting stories and I was aware that, um, you know, people were interested in helping because of the school. But, uh, even after they were published and and I went over for the initial launch party and met some people from the school, uh, it wasn't quite real to me until that second trip, which was my third trip to England, but uh, my second trip over because of the books. And I got to go down to the school and actually uh, we got there early, a few of us, and they gave us a tour and showed us uh, all these different things that uh, uh I, it hadn't been real to me up to that point. I got to meet a lot of the students, and I got to meet Mr. Forbes Nixon and the teachers and the headmaster. So it uh, since then it's become much more special and much more that part of it's much more of a passion too, other than just getting new stories. Hmm. And you also got a chance to sit somewhere a little special. Yeah. Yes, uh, as part of that uh, early tour of the building before it, the place was completely filled up with crowds, uh, we got to spend some time in Doyle's original study, uh, which was now set up as the headmaster's office. And I had known that there was a chance that I would get to do that, so I came prepared and uh, I sat at the desk. It's not his desk, but it's in the same place where his desk is. And I sat there and actually pulled out a piece of paper that I had brought with me and used that opportunity to write the first couple lines of a new story, just sitting in the same spot where where he wrote The Hound of the Baskervilles and The Return. Uh, the spirits moved you. Yeah. But, That's uh, wonderful. Yeah, it, it's a great memory. And luckily, you know, there were pictures made, so I have that memory, too. Excellent. Well, we will have a copy of that picture in the show notes. So uh, make sure, folks, that you stop by ihose.co slash ihose199, all lowercase, um, or you just link through it, link to it through the, um, the notes in your podcast player that you're listening to us on. We're going to take another quick break, and we will be back with David Markham talking about, well, all things from this Sherlockian dynamo. Arthur Conan Doyle wrote 22 novels. The one he thought his best is an adventure story of knights and chivalry. 20-year-old Alan Edrickson travels the world encountering bullies, con artists, thieves, a damsel in distress, and two men who become his closest friends. Together they join the White Company, archers and fighters led by the gallant Sir Nigel Loring. Will our hero win the hand of Loring's romantic daughter, Maud? Will the chivalrous Prince Edward restore Peter of Castile to his Spanish throne? Published in 1891 and never out of print, The White Company is a tale of pageantry and piracy, heraldry and hope, published now in an exclusive, annotated edition 
with the original N.C. Wyeth illustrations in blazing color. Don't you owe it to yourself to read Conan Doyle's favorite book? Get the annotated white company at wessexpress.com. We are back, and if you've been if you've been with us this whole time, that means you you've heard David talk about the origin of the Deerstalker and him about his multiple pastiches that he's written, and even more pastiches that he has edited, particularly under the auspices of MX Publishing. Uh, David, what what what's coming next? I, I you know I know we we noted that you were on volume twenty one of the MX uh, series of Sherlock Holmes stories. What's, what's coming next? Well, um, for these books, I learned early on that uh, even as people are finding out about the current books, I, I need to be already working on the next books. So uh, I'm about to finish up the final edits on volumes 22, 23, and 24, which are some more untold cases which more versions of the giant rat and Crosby, the banker and things like that. Uh, there are 64 stories in those. And I believe the Kickstarter will uh, begin either in late August or early September for those. I don't know the exact date yet. And I have to send Steve Emick some information, which I'm a little bit overdue so he can start planning the Kickstarter website. Um, I'm also editing two different books for Derek Belanger right now, which will be sometime later this year. One of those is called After the East Wind, which is stories that are set uh, from his last book, his last bow, sorry, onward, uh, either set in World War I or the 1920s. And also a series called The Cases of Sherlock Holmes and Solar Ponds, where uh, the two of those uh, work together. Interesting. Now you've you've had an interest in solar ponds for quite a while. Where did that crop up? Well, um, as I mentioned very at the beginning, the first mysteries that I ever read were the Three Investigators, and that author of those books, his name was Robert Arthur. He edited a lot of the collections, the short story collections that were put out under Alfred Hitchcock's name. And so by way of the three investigators, I read some of those Alfred Hitchcock short story collections. And in one of those was a solar pond story. So I actually read a pond story before I had ever read a home story uh, by a couple of years before, probably. And I kind of credit that and my enjoyment of that one with uh, grooving my brain to appreciate the Holmes Watson model of, of how stories are constructed. But um, throughout my teenage years, uh, I, I also collected the Solar Ponds books because they were reissued in those days in paperback. And generally, Ponds is known to some Sherlockians, but he's he's been unknown to a lot more people. Uh, those who know him love him, but he just was kind of forgotten. Uh, they were, for those who don't know, they were uh, pastiches written by August Derleth from the 1920s all the way to the 60s or 70s, and he wrote, I think, over 70 of them. Uh, Solar Ponds is very much like Sherlock Holmes, and they're narrated by Dr. Parker, who is very much like Dr. Watson. But um, I, I was just always interested in those, and several years ago, uh, again, mentioning my friend Bob Byrne, he had a website devoted to solar ponds that had a newsletter. And he had this idea of having uh, some solar ponds pastiches published online, and that way they could be fan fiction and there wouldn't be any need to get permission to publish them. And I thought it was such a good idea that I sat down and wrote one almost immediately. And I enjoyed it so much, I wrote two more. I had three pond stories, and I wasn't quite sure what to do with them. And Bob didn't ever actually get around to publishing that issue of his newsletter. So I had these three stories. So I thought, well, I just I want to see these in a real book. So I got in touch with August Derleth's heirs and talked to them and told them that it was time for ponds to come back. <laughs> and so they authorized me to uh, 
put out a whole new collection of 12 new Pond stories. And uh, so that was the first new ones that had come out since the 70s and 80s. Uh, there was one guy named Basil Copper who had written some with the family's permission after Dirtle died, but otherwise there hadn't been any new ones since then. Hmm. And, and once that was finished, uh, stayed in touch with the family and convinced them that uh, it was time with with new publishing paradigms and the ability to have electronic books and audio books and such, it was time to bring back the original Pond stories by August Derleth and, and republish them for a new generation. So for the next year, I worked with uh, Derek and Brian Belanger and we got all that ready to go. And uh, I, I converted all the original uh, texts that had been originally published by August Derleth and into new word files and re-edited everything. And so, so then we reissued all the Solar Ponds books for the first time in, in a generation. And what's, what's the market for Solar Ponds books? Is it, is it a subset of, of Sherlockian books uh, in terms of, uh, you know, volume and interest or uh, does it rival Sherlock Holmes? Is it greater? Oh, it's definitely not greater. Uh, like I said, I think uh, some Sherlockians have known about ponds all the way through from the 40s and 50s and 60s. Uh, Derleth was a pretty active Sherlockian, and he was friends with a lot of the legendary Sherlockians like uh, Edgar W. Smith and and uh, Ellery Queen, Frederick Denay, and people like that. Uh, now I think more people know about him than they have in years because obviously – we we sell these on Amazon and different places, and there's there's social media ways to spread the word. But uh, he'll never surpass Sherlock Holmes, and and, and hmm. Ponds wouldn't want to surpass you know his <laughs> illustrious predecessor. <laughs> how do you how do you tell them apart? You know, when you think about writing a Pond story, is it do you, um, do you approach it differently? Uh, they Ponds sometimes has more of a twinkle in his eye. And Parker is a little uh, more uh, sarcastic. He, he's not quite as worshipful of Ponds as Watson is of Holmes. Hmm. And, and then, of course, there's the setting. The, the Pond stories take place in the 1920s and 30s, so there's just naturally going to be a few things in those, like automobiles and telephones. And even though Ponds himself is kind of a throwback to the, the Victorian Holmes type detective, he still functions in a, in a world of airplanes and, and more modern things. Do you ever find yourself developing a plot for what you think is one character and you go, you know what, this might actually work really well with the other character. I, I have even just recently, uh, I've, uh, I'm working on another book of pawn short stories, just as I can chip away at those to, to be kind of the next one for my, uh, the one that I wrote a couple of years ago, the, the other 12 stories. And as I was working on those set in the 1920s, I'm also trying to come up with uh, my contribution to the story or to the book after the East Wind, which uh, where Holmes is in the 1920s. And I'm also writing stories for the, the book where Holmes and Pons work together so it's kind of hard to keep these ideas separate because uh, right now in my head, they're all churning around in the 1920s. And for my Holmes 1920s story, it's tempting sometimes to all of a sudden uh, have Pond step on stage. And I'm like, no, I can't because that's not this book. He's not in this story. He can't help out in this one. Mm -hmm. He has to stay in the other story. Now, I know that you also have an interest in Dr. Thorndike, you know, the the, the detective written by Austin Freeman and it, Freeman's work and Thorndike, you know, are also favorites of mine. How good. Um, what, uh, and of course the unique thing for our listeners about Thorndike was that was the inverted detective stories. A great many of Thorndike's cases right. begin with the crime. And so the reader, it's kind of sort of like the old Columbo exactly. television series yeah. begins with the crime. And then the engagement is, you know, how will Thorndike put all these pieces together? Exactly. Uh, but that's very different. Yeah. Um, I kind of came to Thorndike in a strange way. Um, in my quest to to gather up all these Holmes pastiches, I frequently, uh, you know, check Amazon and different places to see which new pastiches have been released. 
I was probably seven or eight years ago, somebody started releasing these home stories on Kindle, Kindle only. They weren't as books. And they were very well written, but, uh, and they seemed very much like the language of, you know, a hundred years ago. But there were certain curious mistakes, like sometimes it wouldn't be set in Baker Street, it would be set in, uh, uh, King's Bench Walk, where Thorndike lives, and I hadn't read any Thorndike then, but uh, I started doing some research, and I realized that somebody was taking these old Thorndike books, and I guess just doing a search and replace, and changing Thorndike's name or to Sherlock Holmes, and 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 this and that. So I was reading these Thorndike stories rewritten as Sherlock Holmes stories, and. I was trying to think like, oh, this makes a pretty good home story, but you know, it maybe it'd be better to actually read it the way it was intended uh, with the original character. So at that point, uh, I sought out the original books and, and found that they were, in fact, really great. And uh, about the time I started reading Thorndike was uh, on my first trip where I got to go to London finally. And so mostly I looked at homes related sites, but uh, some of the places that I visited were in some of these first Thorndikes that I was reading. And it was really amazing uh, how well he described something a hundred years ago that still looks the same way today. If you can look past the, the initial glitz and neon lights and things like that. So David, uh, as we as we wrap up here, because I know we've uh, we've been going for a while here, but there's so much to cover. Uh, you're so fascinating. You've you've got what you call the whole art of detection chronology. Mm -hmm. I know we've we've talked to Vincent W. Wright here yeah. before. We'll have a link to his episode as we talked about uh, Sherlockian chronology, and others have taken their their um, attempts at chronology. I don't think it's a, a practice that will ever cease you know there, there's right. so many different ways of looking at it so many ways of proving out uh different aspects uh, talk to us a little bit about what your focus is and how you're approaching chronology okay well um i initially probably got interested in the idea of chronology when i first uh read baron gould's sherlock holmes of baker street when i was a kid like i said i read that before i even read some of the canon and if you're going to play the game you you kind of have to assume that Holmes and Watson move through the years in a linear fashion, aging and interacting with historical figures and historical events. And um, so I always was kind of interested in where the stories fell in terms of year. It wasn't just that I would read it for the mystery, but uh, I was interested uh, where, how old they were when a story occurred. Were they in their 30s or 40s? You know, was what, which marriage was Watson on, things like that. And um then several years later, there was a, a book of pastiches which really influenced the MX books a lot. It was called the Mammoth Book of New Sherlock Holmes Stories. And in the back of that, he had a chronology that uh, where he had placed the different stories from the canon, but he had also placed the stories from that particular anthology. And that was it. It just covered uh, canon stories and a few, you know, a couple dozen pastiches. But um, in the mid-1990s was when I went back to school to be an engineer, and I worked night jobs while I went to school during the day. And at night, uh, a lot of times I would run out of work to do, so I would just sit around and read. And I started taking in uh, and reading all these Sherlock Holmes books that I had collected over the years. I had found that I kept rereading the same ones, so I decided I'm going to read all these that I bought, even the ones that have just been sitting here. And to do that, I made a little binder with um, uh, some maps in it and things like that that I carried with me so I could look up in England where a story was set or kind of get a, a bigger picture for what was going on in the story. And I started to make notes about when this or that story occurred and where it fit in comparison with Baring Gould's chronology. And by the time I finished that first pass through all those books that I had a year or so later, I had in that binder uh, a, a rudimentary chronology of not only the canon, but uh, all the pastiches that I had at that time. So I kind of typed it up, and I was still in a Holmes mood, so I just kept going and refining it. And so since then, I've been making a chronology and keeping it up to date 
uh, for the most part, uh, of not only canon stories, but uh, pretty much every pastiche, traditional pastiche that I've encountered. And it, uh, it, it gets pretty crowded. Right now, it's, it's somewhere over a thousand pages uh, and, and a bunch of word files, one for each year. And uh, I've talked with Vince Wright about this some. Uh, and in terms of uh, picking dates for the actual canonical cases, uh, to, to do something like I've done, I had to kind of go ahead and decide that so-and-so case was on so-and-so date. And so I, I've kind of quit worrying about where the canon cases are at this point because I'm adding in stuff around them. But, uh, so, yeah. I'll go ahead. As you as you get new stories in from your contributors and you're editing them, do you require them to uh, place the stories in a certain date or, or name the date for you so it makes your chronologizing a little bit easier? No, sometimes I'll ask, but I, I don't require uh, very much at all for these uh, books except that the stories be traditional. Uh, they don't have any anachronisms or actual supernatural encounters or any parody or anything like that. But when I arrange the books, uh, and again, this is highly influenced by that mammoth book of new Sherlock Holmes stories, I arrange the stories chronologically within each set. So, for instance, this next set is going to be three more volumes, and the first volume is 1877 to 1887, and the second is 1888 to 1894, and the third volume then is 1895 to 1903. And that's just where the stories happen to to fall out this time. Well, David, I, I'd like to apologize uh, for taking you away for, you know, what may be, I think, about 60 minutes, which means that the world is probably now deprived of seven or eight stories. I just can't figure out how you could, <laughs> how you have time to eat, much less turn all this stuff out. Oh, I, I found a, a fine uh, line to walk, I guess, where everything works. But uh, I'll have to check my email after this is over because somebody's probably sent me a new story. And that's <laughs> <laughs> That's like a drug. Uh, it really is. Uh, there's no other drug like that when you see that email and, and get the, a little anticipation. It, it hasn't gotten old. Now, if, if somebody wanted to uh, try their hand at a story and, and were interested in uh, joining up one of your anthologies, uh, what's the process like? Um, well, uh, I put an, an email address in the books. It's the papers of Sherlock Holmes at gmail.com. And then uh, I, I got on Facebook specifically for Sherlockian contacts and, and, and Sherlockian literary discussions and things like that. I'm not so much of a, a connector with old high school friends or anything like that. So if they're on Facebook, they can send me a message that way. Uh, they can send messages to uh, Steve Emmix or Derek Belanger, and those will both find their way to me. Uh, like I said, I just I generally remind people that it has to – essentially be like a story Watson would tell, and that would have appeared in the Strand. Uh, nothing too edgy, nothing, no parody, nothing, anything like that. Just a typical, traditional, canonical Sherlockian story. Excellent. Well, I hope uh, our interview with you here brings you a, a couple of new uh, submissions. You know, it never hurts to have additional material from which to pull. We wish you all the best as you move forward and, and many more healthy uh, years and volumes of Sherlockian editing and writing. Well, thank you. And thank you all for taking time to talk to me. I really appreciate it. And I love the show. It's one of the things we should have mentioned is the links here, because David, you know, particularly with his interest in August Derleth, now, I read all those Durla stories when I was probably a similar age to David in paperback. So it's been a long time, and I don't really remember them. But what I remember is that the reason why Durla uh, wrote those stories was he got basically got to the end of the canon and wanted more. Hmm. And David's whole output here in this extraordinary collection of stories just shows you how insatiable the demand is for the continuation of these characters and the puzzles they solve and the joy of reading these kinds of adventures. Yeah. Well, I, I remember 
um, I can't remember exactly when in my Sherlockian career. It was pretty early on. Uh, I started reading the stories when I was in my mid to early teens. Uh, and I think by the time I went away to college, I discovered um, the exploits of Sherlock Holmes, of course, by uh, John Dixon Carr and Adrian Conan Doyle. Obviously, these were authorized by the estate. Uh, Carr uh, was a noted mystery writer, uh, and Adrian Conan Doyle was a noted browbeater. And uh, <laughs> because of that, I think uh, Carr quit partway through the project, leaving uh, Conan Doyle to finish the darn stories himself, essentially. And it showed. <laughs> Um, so, you know, you could get to the end of the canon and say, oh, well, here's, here's one authorized by the Conan Doyle estate. It's got the Conan Doyle name on it, as well as Dixon Carr. And you begin reading them. Yeah, they're, they're pretty good. They're reminiscent of the feel. Uh, and then they just go over the cliff pretty quickly. So, you know, it, it was interesting to me to hear that, uh, David in, in his editorial persona, uh, looks for stories that only take place in that canonical time frame. No anachronisms, as he said. No uh, automobiles or aliens or supernatural things. He, he really wants to keep it pure as far as pastiche goes. I think that's fascinating. Well, you know what else is fascinating? That music, and that means it can be only one thing. Yep, that's right. It is time for Canonical Couplet, everyone's favorite Sherlockian quiz show where you have a chance to win a prize. And we will get you a copy of Volume 21 of the MX Book of Sherlock Holmes as edited by David Markham as your prize this time around. Before we do that, let's get to where we were the last time we gave you this clue. The apparent thief was quickly discovered, and nearby, the key to the box room cupboard. Bert, do you know the solution of this episode's canonical couplet? Yes, I do. This is one of my favorite stories. This is the story of the scout troop that's lost in southeast England. This is the one that, that Conan Doyle called the Sussex Campfire. Oh, I want to not laugh, and I also want to not bang my head against the desk. Ah, <laughs> uh, no such luck there. No, no, Bert. This what? was. What? I know, shocking as it is, right? Um, this is the adventure of the barrel coronet. Oh dear. Yes. Well, you were not alone in your guessing. Actually, uh, we had one guest come through that it was the adventure of the Barry Cornishones. <laughs> Oh, I like that. The buried cornishons. Now yeah. I can't use that. Oh, well. We can thank Eric Deckers for that. Oh, that's great, Eric. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's one of the names that we'll throw in the barrel here as we uh, get the big prize wheel ready. Now, I, I have an admission. I'm, I'm kind of loathe to admit this, but while I was putting it away last time, I dropped the big prize wheel. Uh-oh. Yeah, it was not pretty. It went... It, it actually went rolling down the basement stairs and hit a wall and smashed into about a hundred pieces. So um, I'm, I'm putting it back together. So if it sounds a little uneven, uh, you'll know why, but hopefully we'll still get the desired results. So stand back as I spin and the big prize wheel watching it go around. It looks pretty good. It's pretty good. It's not wobbling too much and it lands on number 17. Ha, look at that. Canonical 17. I love that. And it corresponds to Frank Dudgeon. <laughs> Frank, congratulations. You get a copy of, what do you get a copy of? Oh, a piece of BSI memorabilia. So stay tuned for, uh, for that. Um, I need to look into the, into the prize vault and see what, what we're going to give you. So, um, now, here we go. This time around, we have a new, a brand new clue for you for this canonical couplet. Here we go. A post from Pondicherry and another from Dundee took a client's life 
by Villains Dead Upon the Sea. If you think you know the answer to this canonical couplet, put it in an email addressed to comment by com with canonical couplet in the subject line. If you are among all of the correct responses and we choose your name at random, you will win that MX book. Good luck. All right. It's that time once again. Goodness, is it still 2020? Mm. <laughs> this is the year that never quit. No. Even when you want it to. What a year. Ah, it's been challenging all around. But, hey, we are still going like clockwork here. We have an episode every 15th and 30th of the month. And uh, we do appreciate you uh, being along for the ride. And we also appreciate uh, some of the ratings and reviews that you've given us recently. We have seen those come through on Apple Podcasts and elsewhere. So we thank you for those. Uh, we do read them, and we are encouraged by them. So uh, keep doing that, folks. Uh, you know, if you've if you've done it before, or if you started and stopped, you know, why don't you consider uh, giving it another shot? Because it helps other people find the show as well. Well, until next time, this is the purely 2020 Scott Monty, and this is the at best 2040 Burt Wolder. And we're peering through our spectacles as we look straight out at you and say, The, the Games of Foot! <laughs> the, the Games, games of Foot! You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes.